So good afternoon and welcome again to the uh, communication signal processing seminar. Um, so before I get started, I should thank uh, the people behind the scenes who are actually making this happen. Uh, uh, Kate Goodwin and uh, Edwin and Shelley Falcon. They're, uh, things will just break if they don't um, put in 300%. <coughs> uh, anyway, I'm delighted today to, uh, to introduce a speaker who's uh, Ben Van Roy. So ben is a professor at Stanford University in the Management Science and Engineering Department, but he, uh, he received his degree a while back from, from Lids at MIT, uh, the PhD degree, and he has been, his research is uh, focused on reinforcement learning with lots of foundational uh, contributions. Um, <clears throat> beyond academia, he leads a deep mind research team in Mountain View. And he's also led research programs at Unica, acquired by IBM, Univis, acquired by SIRF, and Morgan Stanley. He's a fellow of uh, Informed and IEEE, and uh, <clears throat> I can keep, uh, he's got lots of awards and various things I can keep talking about him, but I think all of us want to hear from him directly than from me, so I'll uh, give the floor to Ben. Go ahead, Ben, you're all yours. <clears throat> You're muted for some reason, but that's the. Ben, you're muted. I cannot hear you. <clears throat> All right, how about now? Yeah, now it's fine. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thanks very much, Vijay. It's a pleasure to. Be speaking in this venue. It's been a while since I visited uh, your department at uh, Michigan, and uh, unfortunately, uh, well, we're, we're remote this time. But I'll look forward to uh, catching up with all of you uh, in the future. Um, all right. So, so this uh, <clears throat> this uh, talk uh, is on some work I've been doing. Uh, uh, at Stanford, and uh, most of the work is actually done by uh, Shi Dong, who's a, a PhD student here. Um, and, and before I get started, I uh, thought I'd share a bit of my take on the state of the art in reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning uh, has demonstrated some impressive successes in simulated uh, environments. And uh, the tr whoops. And the trend uh, seems to be um, to tackle uh, increasingly uh, complex uh, simulated environments. Um, but uh, there are high hopes for translating this success to uh, real environments though uh, major uh, advances in data efficiency are required for that. And uh, this is a cartoon plot uh, produced by my friend Martin Reedmiller, who's a roboticist. And I'm not going to interpret it carefully, but the takeaway message he intended was that to train a robot from scratch to do even very simple tasks like uh, stacking blocks, uh, requires on the order of a year of experience uh, in, in trial and error with a robotic arm. So, so to do something more sophisticated obviously takes much longer. And his point is that uh, we really need to uh, improve data uh, efficiency in order to, to do uh, what we hope to do uh, with reinforcement learning. Um, another um, uh, theme of this work is that we want to end up with data requirements uh, that are very small relative to uh, the environment complexity. In a sense, uh, we want an agent to be able to do something useful uh, without gathering so much data that it has to learn uh, everything about the environment. Um, all right, so, so let me get started with uh, my formalism, uh, which will involve this uh, interface between an agent and, and an environment. And uh, I, I think of this as the uh, most general uh, reinforcement learning interface. 
um, where you know there's an agent interacting with an unknown environment. At each time, the agent executes an action AT, and uh, the environment spits back an observation OT plus one. And uh, this uh, process continues, uh, action, observation, action, action, observation, ad infinitum. Um, and for the purpose of this talk, to keep things simple, I'm going to assume that the uh, set of actions is finite and a set of observations is finite. <clears throat> um, it's useful to define a concept uh, of history. History at time t, ht is a sequence of actions and observations up through time t. <clears throat> One thing to note is I'm not making any Markovity or episodicity assumptions uh, about this interaction. Uh, the environment could uh, take on an arbitrary form here. And, uh, and I think of uh, these Markovity and episodicity assumptions uh, as assumptions made to uh, produce didactic special cases of environments uh, emphasized in the literature uh, for the purpose of uh, instruction. <clears throat> All right, just to offer one example uh, of uh, a uh, the kind of interaction between agent and environment that uh, one might imagine here. And uh, well, you know, uh, Satinder, who's in the audience, uh, actually wrote a paper on this at some point years ago. But you could think of a dialogue system <clears throat> in these terms, uh, where the agent uh, first transmits a message to the environment. For example, uh, how can I help? And, uh, and the environment spits back a message and, and such a uh, conversation continues ad infinitum, uh, perhaps uh, you know, with an agent designed to, to help uh, users accomplish things. <clears throat> um, now, the environment could you know, be many different things. Uh, in this case, in a, of a dialogue system uh, with a human being talking to the agent. Um, you could also, you know, imagine an environment that uh, is in tune with a lot of the work uh, done in, in your uh, in your department here, uh, uh, involving networking. Um, you could imagine, for example, a queuing network, where the agent is uh, uh, <coughs> executing actions that assign uh, servers to tasks, and um, and the uh, observations come that come back inform the agent about queue links. Right, and, and, and such an interaction also fits this framework. <clears throat> or you could consider the internet. Um, and, uh, and you can imagine an agent uh, taking, you know, uh, applying keystrokes to a computer and uh, observing uh, what's on the screen. And, and the agent could, you know, just uh, interact over time through a computer with the internet. And such an agent might be designed, for example, to uh, educate a populace or to, for example, uh, identify fake news and tag that, uh, or, or many other things. Um, but when you get to this level of uh, complexity where the agent is dealing with the internet, it starts to become clear that, uh, that the agent uh, uh, has got to be much simpler uh, than the environment and that uh, the amount of data it can gather is not going to inform it about all uh, that I'll, I'll everything, <clears throat> I won't tell it everything about the environment. Okay, questions? No, there aren't any questions as of now. No. Please uh, chime in if you, I mean, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. It'd actually be cool if people turn on video so that we could make it more social. That would work too, I'm turning mine on. <laughs> Thanks. Ah, good. For a second there, I thought I was talking to a bunch of black screens. <laughs> uh, so, um, okay. So, so <clears throat> reinforcement learning, uh, as I see it, uh, addresses the subject of agent uh, design, how to design such an agent. And the, uh, the, the idea is to uh, design an agent that operates effectively given uh, an agent environment interface. And the, the, the issues we want to talk about today have to do with whether uh, we can design an agent that might be efficient uh, across a broad range of environments uh, where the uh, complexity of the environment is anticipated to be uh, much greater than that of the agent. Okay. And, and what, what we're going to talk about 
is a, a, a particular a simple agent that's designed for this setting. And, and uh, this agent uh, operates by uh, tracking, instead of the environment state, it tracks an agent state that offers a simplifying lens into the complex environment um, and allows it to operate with limited uh, memory and computation. Um, and, and, the, and the particular agent we'll talk about uh, uses an optimistic Q learning algorithm. Um, and we'll study uh, what such an agent can accomplish. <clears throat> the uh, eventual performance of such an agent as we'll characterize it depends on how well uh, its aleatoric state can predict value. As I'll, I'll discuss later, uh, aleatoric state is a part of, uh, of the agent state. And, um, and, and also we'll talk about how the data requirements of this agent uh, grow with the complexity of the agent's aleatoric state dynamics uh, and uh, <clears throat> can, can be uh, independent, fortunately, of the complexity of the environment. All right. Um, a few disclaimers. So as with much of the um, theoretical uh, reinforcement learning literature, um, I can recommend you actually use the agent we're going to describe. Um, it can be improved in so many ways, and so many of them we'll see immediately as we talk about the agent. Um, but, but the point of the agent is really to generate insight. <coughs> uh, it serves as a constructive proof and sanity check that it's possible to develop an agent whose, whose uh, data requirements don't have to scale with the complexity of the environment. But unlike a lot of the theoretical reinforcement learning literature, uh, this agent actually does connect in some way with uh, ideas that are used in practical agent design. <clears throat> uh, in, fact, in fact, there's some commonality with successful agents, uh, be part, largely because of uh, the fact that the agent uh, relies on cue learning. Um, and, um, and, and as such, uh, this, a this agent and, and the analysis may offer uh, a, a starting point for a bridge uh, between uh, the theory and practice of reinforcement learning, uh, as well as a starting point for more principled uh, agent design. So Ben, I have a uh, quick question. Sure. In, in this case, you do you assume that the, um, I mean, the simple agent's aleatoric state complexity is fixed? It doesn't change over time or? Uh, uh, yes, but I'll, I'll introduce that. Uh, yes, yeah. so if you wait a few slides, that should become clear. But the short answer is yes. Yeah. All right. So let me talk about that now. Uh, the agent state, uh, the reward, and, and, and policies. Um, okay. So. <clears throat> so. Um, so the, the agent state is everything the agent retains in memory. Everything the agent has access to in selecting its next action. And in studying the various uh, ways of designing agents in the reinforcement learning literature, what I find is uh, the way they organize their, the agent state uh, can be thought of in terms of a, a, a triple, right? Agent states are made of, of a part that I would call the algorithmic state a part that I call the aleatoric state and a part that I call the epistemic state. Okay, so this is just offered a template that helps me organize my thinking about how uh, existing agents have been designed. And let me talk about uh, each of these parts. So, so algorithmic state is stuff that the agent remembers that has nothing to do with the environment. All right. And so for example, maybe the agent is producing random numbers along the way and has to remember some of those, uh, et cetera, right? And, and for the specific agent we're going to uh, cover today, uh, the, a, the, the algorithmic state is just time, okay? So the agent just remembers how long it's lived for so far. Okay, that's the only uh, algorithmic state. And that just has to do with the agent, has nothing to do with the environment. Okay. The aleatoric state uh, is meant to uh, summarize the agent's current situation in the environment. 
And, and for our agent today, the aleatoric state is going to be up, updated using uh, an update function F that's hard coded by, uh, by the uh, uh, designer. And uh, <clears throat> this function F produces the next aleatoric state ST plus one as a function of the previous state ST, the action AT and the observation OT plus one. Okay, and, and this relates to Vijay's question. Um, one, one, uh, one notable fact here is that the aleatoric state update function F is fixed in our agent. It's hard coded by the designer. Uh, you know, for, for a practical uh, agent uh, that is more general than this, you probably want an aleatoric state update function that you adapt over time with experience to improve uh, how, you, uh, how you generate aleatoric states. Okay, but for our agent today, F is a fixed function. Okay, finally, there's the epistemic state, which represents knowledge that the agent is retaining about the environment. And for our agent, the, uh, al the epistemic state has two parts to it. One is an action value function, QT. You know, some people call this the Q function of Q learning. Okay, uh, so that is something that the agent is retaining that uh, encodes information the agent has learned about the environment. Uh, and the other part of the uh, epistemic state in our agent will be a count function, CT, that represents uh, a number of times each uh, state action pair uh, has been visited. And by state there, I mean uh, aleatoric state. Okay, questions? All right. So <clears throat> given this notion of state and the way we design our agent, it's useful to think about uh, three classes of policies. Okay. So, um, so there'll be policies that select actions based on history, policies that select actions based on agent state, and policies that select actions based on aleatoric state. Okay. And in, in the first class, you know, assigns probabilities to actions. Uh, using a, a policy pi that, that is a function of history, right? And I'm representing the set of such policies by that uh, cyan uh, ellipse uh, p script hist for history. All right, then, then, then another interesting class of policies is a class that the agent might uh, implement because you know, the agent only retains in memory uh, agent state. The agent state is xt. And so, and so there's a second class of policies, P script agent, which uh, represents mappings from, uh, uh, his, from agent state to action probabilities. Okay. And of course, that's a subset of, of the first class, uh, P his. And finally, um, there's a, a class that maps uh, aleatoric state to action. Um, and, um, and that's a further subset. Um, and here we're talking about policies that assign action probabilities based on the aleatoric state. All right, so what's the point of, uh, uh, well, what, what is the agent after? Well, we're gonna, we're gonna characterize uh, the designer's preferences uh, in terms of a, a reward function. And the idea is that um, at each time, uh, there's this function R right, that each, uh, There's this, hmm. There's this function R that at each time, that the function R is hard coded by the designer and at each time it produces a reward RT plus one based on the aleatoric state, the action and, and the observation. Um, and, uh, and so the agent as it operates assesses how well it's doing by using this reward function. And also, you know, in order to keep track of where, where it thinks it is in the environment, the agent is always updating this uh, aleatoric state using the update function F. Okay. And, 
and um, and we're going to think of the agent as trying to maximize average reward defined in this way. Yes? Is there a question there? I thought I heard oh. something. Yeah. Sorry, my phone rang. Sorry, it was my mistake. Oh, no worries. <laughs> I got it out. No worries. Um, okay, I, so I had a quick question. Yep. So just to be uh, clear, so that ST plus one is, uh, you're not redefining the state, right? It is just that what my aleatoric state is as of now. It is not redefining what the state is supposed to be, right? Um, well, I, I guess it's exactly as is. There's some function F that the designer uh, endows the agent with. Uh, the agent all gets from the environment are these observations. And uh, it's updating this object in this manner. Okay. And, and okay, so for each policy, there's a average reward lambda pi. And uh, and the way we can think about this is uh, the agent, the designer would like to, to maximize that average reward. Okay, now we talked about three classes of policies. Let me talk about one policy that's of particular interest in each class. Okay, in the class of policies that uh, depend on history, we have what we call the optimal policy pi star, okay? And that's the policy that chooses the best possible action based on history, uh, if you had full knowledge uh, of the environment. And so, and so this is a policy that attains uh, optimal uh, average reward, lambda pi, with full knowledge of the environment. And, and I call that average reward lambda star as well, okay? So of course, you know, because the agent is uncertain about the nature of the environment, you know, we shouldn't expect it to do as well as this, uh, this policy because this policy requires full knowledge of the environment. Uh, then there's the agent policy, pi agent, right? And, and this is our algorithm, right? Our algorithm keeps track of an agent state, xt, and produces an action, at, right? And pi agent is what assigns uh, probabilities to actions given the way we're applying our agent. And that has some average reward. Okay, so this is the average reward that our agent actually uh, attains, right? For better or worse, given given the way we've designed our agent. So, so we'd like to prove something about this. But we'd like to say our agent is attaining a reward lambda pi agent that is good, you know, probably not as good as lambda star, but hopefully not that bad compared to lambda star. Okay, so that's um, Okay, then there's the uh, target policy, um, uh, pi target. And, and that's from this class of policies that select actions based only on aleatoric state. All right, and the way to think about pi target is um, that is how well our agent is actually hoping to do. Right, it's going to hope to do about as well as the best policy that selects actions based on aleatoric state, and and indeed uh, pi target is defined <clears throat> as the policy that maximizes reward among those that select actions based on the aleatoric state. Okay, so aleatoric state is telling the agent what it thinks its situation is in the environment. Uh, you, know, you, you can imagine the, an agent selecting actions based on what it thinks its situation is. And, and we're talking about here the, the policy that does best among those. Uh, ben, I had a question. Yep. Uh, so uh, the reward, should this be thought of as, uh, you know, agent's preferences or, you know, the feedback from the environment? 
and the distinction I'm looking for is should it, should it be a function of the uh, agent state or the aleatoric state, I guess, in your case, versus a function of the history. Um, so and, you know, good. So, so the picture I have here is uh, the we're designing an agent that we're going to let loose in the wild, and all it receives from the environment are observations. Okay. And the designer encodes a reward function within the agent that reflects the designer's preferences. And the designer also designs the aleatoric state update function with an understanding that that aleatoric state is going to be used in evaluating rewards. I see. So, I, so the idea here is that they, my preferences should go through the you know, same interface between the agent and the environment uh, instead of you know something uh, being like the inherent property of the environment, which I cannot really uh, abstract out uh, due to you know, whatever bounds that the agent has. I see. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, I should mention this is a. Uh... Uh, as a tender note, the point of contention is in, in the uh, uh, Sutton Bartow book, reward is viewed as being supplied by the environment. Right? And you could think of that as a special case of my formulation, because if reward is part of the observation, then that makes it particularly simple to define a reward function. You just pick up that part of the observation of your reward. But the formulation I'm talking about here allows you to have more complex reward functions. All right. Um, let's talk about uh, how this agent works. So, um, so what I'm going to do here is going to. You know, the agents are the piece of software, and and I'm not going to tell you uh, how that software works yet. I'm only going to tell you uh, what the inputs are, uh, how you initialize the software before you let the agent loose in the wild, so that you have a clear picture of what the agent uh, requires before it starts uh, operating. Okay, so so one thing is you need to specify the set of actions, the set of observations. Uh, you have to specify the set of aleatoric states. Uh, you have to specify the aleatoric state update function F. Uh, you have to provide an initial aleatoric state S0. And you need uh, to specify a reward function that maps state action observation triples to the unit interval. Okay, and that's it. That's all you supply the agent with. There's no other hyperparameters or anything like that. Okay, so after you, you supply the software with that, you can let the agent loose on the environment. And then it goes through the cycle, action observation, action observation, et cetera. Uh, and you can think of that cycle as a process uh, through which the agent is applying you know, the agent policy. Um, right, and that's it. That's the picture. That's our, that's our agent. Okay, so next I want to talk about performance guarantees that pertain to this agent. And I haven't tell, told you yet what the agent's doing. Uh, I'll get to that after I share with you some uh, understanding of the performance guarantees. Okay, so we're going to assess performance in terms of regret and um, define regret in this way, where I sum the uh, expected difference between the optimal average reward lambda star and the realized reward RT plus one. And I'll, I'll have a uh, measure of regret for each time capital T. All right, so, so one. Uh, uh, thing to note is if you take the limit of regret scaled by time, well, that's the difference in average reward 
between lambda star and lambda pi agent. Lambda pi agent is the average reward realized by the agent. All right, um, reward averaging times. Okay, so so in in to to, to discuss our performance guarantees, uh, there are a couple of statistics that uh, we need to uh, understand because they appear in the bounds. Uh, one is this notion of reward averaging time, um, and and the idea of reward averaging time is uh, that we need some statistic that. Uh, reflects uh, how quickly the agent can assess and compare policies, right? If the agent can't even assess and compare policies, how can it learn to do well, right? So the agent needs to be able to assess and compare policies in a reasonable time. And the reward averaging time is meant to uh, uh, characterize that. It's how long it takes to ensure that. All right. And, and the idea here is we want to be able to compute uh, average reward and, 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 and a statistic that helps us assess how long it'll take to do that uh, is, is one that tells us how large of a horizon you need to get the expectation of the average within epsilon of the real average, okay? And, and you want, this statistic to apply uniformly across all histories. So you want the agent to be able to say at any time, I'm going to start trying, you know, policy pi, and I want to be able to figure out within some number of time step how good that policy is. And so you want some statistic that ensures that we are able to do that. Okay, and and that statistic I'm going to call tau pi. Tau pi is a statistic, it's a number, such that when I divide by epsilon, uh, that offers me an upper bound and the number of time steps required to get my expected average within epsilon of the true average. Okay, so that's tau pi. So for each policy pi, there's some reward averaging times tau pi. And, and, and there's you know, the definition, so tau pi. All right, um, let me talk about uh, another concept that I, I think all of you are familiar with. So ben, uh, yep. just a quick question. Is the so reward averaging time is somewhat similar to the mixing time or is it different in some sense? Or is for yeah, the, the yeah. policy that you have? Suppose it's a Markovian policy, of course. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so most people, when they talk about mixing time, you know, they're, they're talking about some metric like, uh, total variation or entropy or something, right? And we're trying to avoid that, right? We we're looking just at how long it takes to average the reward. And so that's a concept that also appears at various places in the literature, but, but in reinforcement learning, actually, uh, uh, Satinder's paper with Michael Kearns from many years ago uh, uses a concept in that, different from ours here, but, but in the same vein, right? Where all you care about really is to get the right average reward. You don't care about other notions of mixing Going on. Yeah, I, I guess you're just interested in one functional, not interested in a class of functionals in some Correct. sense. Correct. Yeah, no, I get it now. Thank you. Yeah. So, discounted value. Um, we talk about the discounted value function for a policy pi. I think you all know what that is. Uh, you know, at a history h, v pi gamma h is the discounted value starting at that history if you apply policy pi. Um, uh, given a discount factor gamma, right, uh, you know, we're, we're downweighting future rewards. And, and you can think of that as implementing an effective horizon uh, of one over one minus gamma for you know, the horizon over which you really uh, uh, care about rewards when you use this discount factor. Okay, and then there's an optimal discounted value function, right, uh, where we optimize over pi, uh, and, and those objects uh, will help us characterize the next statistic we want. 
So to understand this next statistic, uh, you know, it, it really has to do with uh, understanding how well we can predict discounted value, right? And uh, an important observation is that, uh, you know, aleatoric state, aleatoric states and the aleatoric state update function uh, induce an aggregation of histories. Okay, so for any history, you end up in some aleatoric state, right? And there are fewer aleatoric states than histories. So this is like a, a, an aggregation function. And, um, and you could consider predicting discounted future value as a function of aleatoric state instead of history. And our agent is going to do that. It's going to predict value using aleatoric state instead of history. Okay, and the way to think about this is suppose, you know, this is the set of histories represented by an orange uh, ellipse. Uh, you know, the, the set is partitioned uh, based on a, uh, partitioned into um, aleatoric states. And, and for two histories in the same cell of the partition, uh, you uh, end up in the same aleatoric state after witnessing that history. All right. Now, this partition, you know, this, uh, this notion of aleatoric state and, and, and the, the, the notion that we're going to predict value based on aleatoric state instead of history uh, um, leads to this uh, class of uh, representable functions. So you can think of our predictions as function of history, but, but which are constrained so that when two histories fall in the same aleatoric state, we generate the same prediction. Okay, so, so there's this interesting class of functions uh, that you can sort of sort of think of as piecewise constant because it's constant over each partition. And we're going to use such functions to predict value. Okay, so we're going to predict value using only aleatoric state and not history. All right, so, so when you think about generating predictions in this way, uh, an important concept is the fidelity of aleatoric states. So aleatoric states may not allow us to perfectly predict value. And, and, and clearly, uh, the uh, accuracy with which alle aleatoric states can predict value uh, will impact uh, the agent's performance. Um, and so, so we're going to define this notion of fidelity, which is another statistic that appears in our uh, performance guarantees. Um, and, and, and this fidelity delta is defined as follows. So first, uh, we, we you know, uh, for, for, for any gamma, for any discount factor gamma, right, we take the minimum error you can attain with respect to the soup norm, the minimum error you can attain over this class of functions that generate predictions based only on aleatoric state. Okay, so we're minimizing over that class of function. And then I maximize over discount factors gamma that lead to effective horizons longer than the reward mixing time of the target policy. Okay, so that's a, that's a mouthful. So, so what's the target policy again? The target policy is the policy that attains maximum average reward among all policies that select actions based on aleatoric state. Okay, that's the target policy. So, so the target policy is going to have a particular reward mixing time. Right? If, I, if, I, if I try the target policy, it's going to take me a while to figure out how good that target policy is. Okay, that, that's uh, proportional to tau pi target. And so what I'm saying here is I'm measuring fidelity of aleatory state by looking at uh, all horizons longer than the horizon required to evaluate um, the target policy, okay? Okay, so that's delta. Delta equals zero would be good news because that means we can predict value perfectly using aleatoric state. All right, so here's the regret bound uh, and, and there are three terms to it. Uh, one is a persistent term that grows with time. And, and the, the key here, uh, this is actually something I've been trying to figure out for about 15 years, whether it's possible to get this. But the key here is that 
uh, this uh, quantity scales with a constant times the fidelity delta. Okay. Um, the second term is transient, uh, and it grows with t to the four fifths. Um, and, and the third term, I don't really care about. It's going to be dominated by others. So a couple of remarks. Uh, the, the most one, one interesting thing about this bound is there's no dependence on the number of environment states. Okay, so, so that's, we're trying to avoid any dependence on number of environment states and we've succeeded with that here. Second is there's no dependence on other concepts of environment complexity, except perhaps uh, through the aleatoric state fidelity delta and the target policy uh, reward average and time trial pi target. Okay. Finally, uh, if we take the limit of uh, regret scaled by time, we get the difference between uh, the optimal average award lambda star and uh, the uh, average award uh, attained by the agent, and, and that's bounded above by 15 delta. Okay. All right, so, so as I mentioned, this is good news. Uh, we get something that's scaled linearly uh, with delta. And um, and I wrote a paper in 2006 that suggested that it might be possible to get within two delta, but no better. Uh, but I didn't have a computationally tractable uh, uh, approach to doing that. In, in this this new work, uh, in this new work, she uh, I think generated the first uh, computationally tractable approach for achieving this. Um, and, and by the way, I'm not only talking about reinforcement learning, there's, there's a significant literature on, on, on this kind of thing in approximate dynamic programming where people do state aggregation and then try to uh, do some computation to get a good approximation of the value function and, and use that approximation. And so, for example, Ward Witt had a couple of papers on this in the 1970s, but, but many, many others have had such, such papers. And one thing common to these papers is they always have some notion of fidelity like delta, but it's not scaled by constant. It's scaled by constant times the mixing time or times one over one minus the discount factor or something like that. Okay, so it's much worse than a constant times delta. And so this is sort of interesting. And, and, and this comes from some of the magic, uh, I think of reinforcement learning and, and in particular temporal difference methods. Uh, somehow it gets rid of a dependence on a uh, on some some notion of mixing time, and, and there may be broader implications of this, uh, you know, in general, uh, in ways people do uh, and work with discretization uh, uh, in in, in, in uh, solving continuous state control problems. But I haven't uh, looked at that carefully. So Ben, a quick question here. Um, yeah. So I so this delta in some sense is a Function of both the environment and the um, uh, and in some sense the, the the function the f that you've chosen and the aleatoric state and some it's a combination in some ways right and going at, I mean as a designer I don't know what that delta would be so right. I mean how would I think about designing my f and the cho choosing the thing if I yeah. I mean, is there something I don't recommend you using this agent design. No, but I was thinking even conceptually. I mean, as a conceptually. Conceptually, what, what might one, one do, right? You mm -hmm. might you take F to be a recurrent neural network, right? And you might update those parameters over time, right? Based on feedback from the environment, right? Always trying to improve your state representation, right? And those parameters would just constitute part of your epistemic state. Okay. I mean, in the, in the part of the reason I was asking is suppose I, I know that my performance is dominated by this term and I'm not doing well enough and I need to increase my complexity or not. I mean, how do I ever get that? How do I come up with that sort of a decision in the middle as an agent? Yeah, so, so I think there's a huge gap between what I'm talking about here and designing a practical agent. Right? And um, 
And so uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to feel like that right now. But, but the hope is that uh, some of the insight that comes out of this analysis uh, offers a starting point where we can continue to build more theory and insight that gradually closes that gap. Thank you. Um, yes, let me talk a bit about the learning time. Uh, so I talked about you know the asymptotic performance being within 15 delta of optimal. Um, how long does it take us to get there? Well, all the regret bound uh, implies that it's a polynomial. You get, you get within epsilon of that in time polynomial in the number of aleatoric states and of actions. You know, the reward makes in time the target policy and whatever else time. So the key here is that this doesn't depend on environment complexity. Um, and, and, you know, we'd really like to think of the environment as being so complex that the mixing time would be infinite. And so it's good that uh, we're avoiding that here. Now, a special case of this uh, is where, you know, the aleatoric state is the environment state, right? Like maybe the designer is not dealing with such a complex environment and was able to update the aleatoric state in a way where it always identifies the true environment state. Um, well, in that case, the result should specialize to something like uh, what this Kern Singh paper did in 2002, which really uh, uh, spearheaded this area of uh, you know, efficient reinforcement learning with tabular uh, MDPs. Okay. Um, and, you know, I should mention that that thread of work uh, led to a lot of stuff, but, but some of the recent work in, 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 along this thread uh, analyzes um, um, optimistic Q learning, which is a, an algorithm along the lines of what we're using here, but uh, but in uh, tabular MDPs, and and actually sort of special classes of tabular MDPs. So 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 the work of Jin, for example, uh, uh, which is very nice, uh, you know, shows that Q learning, optimistic Q learning, is efficient in tabular MDPs. Um, um, and uh, uh, they, they focus on uh, episodic time inhomogeneous uh, type of MDPs. But regardless, uh, there's some interesting ideas that emerge from that work that we leveraged in order to uh, do what we uh, did in this work. All right, so, uh, so let me talk a bit about uh, the, the, how the agent works. And, um, and uh, the agent, uh, as I mentioned, takes these inputs. Um, and uh, what I haven't talked about is the agent's epistemic state. Uh, and, and so the, 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 al the core algorithm it's in the agent updates its uh, epistemic state, uh, QT and CT. And the algorithm works as follows. At each time, the agent selects uh, a greedy action, and an action that maximizes its current action value function, QT. And then it updates uh, its aleatoric state based on the environment feedback. Um, and then it's gonna update the epistemic state. First, we just you know, uh, take the epistemic state to be what it was before. And then we update components corresponding to the state action pair we just witnessed. Uh, the count of the state action pair we just witnessed is, uh, is uh, increased by one. And uh, the Q value, the action value, is updated using a Q learning uh, iteration, um, where the step size is indexed by uh, the number of times that state action pair had been visited. And um, and uh, and like Q learning, we use uh, reward plus the discount factor times the maximum over values of the next uh, state. But uh, the, the, what makes this uh, version optimistic is a tack on this optimistic boost, which is a beta, uh, some parameter beta divided by the square root of the count. Now, okay, so that's the agent. It's that simple, except I, I haven't told you yet how we choose beta and how we choose the step size sequence. And there's also a couple other nuances. So let me speak briefly about all that. 
All right, so, so what we actually have to do to get this agent to uh, satisfy the regret bound reestablished is once in a while we reset the counts and the Q, Q values. Uh, and, and so initially at time zero, we let the counts be zero and we let the action values be zero. And then, uh, oh, sorry, we cut, let the count be zero, we let the action values be one over one minus a discount factor for some initial discount factor. Um, and, and one over one minus discount factor because that's an upper bound on discounted reward because rewards are between zero and one. Then um, we let step sizes uh, take this form. Um, and, uh, and, and the agent, what it has to do is it occasionally increases both the discount factor and the optimistic boost coefficient. And, and whenever it does that, uh, it resets uh, the action value function and, and accounts in this way. Okay, so, so the, the idea is the discount factor and optimistic boost coefficients are increasing over time. Uh, and whenever they're increased, I sort of start over with uh, an optimistic Q function and, and zero count. Okay. So, so if all that is done carefully, uh, done right, um, we are regret not this. Okay, and details of how that can be done is in the paper. Question. Hey Ben, I have a quick question. Yeah. So, uh, what's the reason to reset the Q value? It seems like uh, if we have learned the environment or learned the policy through the Q value it will be more efficient to keep some of the Q value, right? Instead of just completely reset it. Yeah, yeah, and this is not a practical agent. Uh, this, so, so yeah, so there's elements of this agent that feel reasonable, like the fact that we're updating using Q learning, that sort of seems reasonable. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, at some point uh, we decide, okay, let's uh, try to prove a regret bound and publish a paper. And at that point, we put on our you know, theory CS cap and say, how, what ugly thing can we do here to take a sprint to get a regret bond, right? And the way we increase uh, uh, the discount factor and, and the optimistic boost beta are in that spirit of, you know, let's get a result out. It's not in the spirit of, hey, there's some insight here on how we should be increasing these things uh, exactly in a, in a practical agent design. But the discount factor is also changing, though, right? So I mean, it's not clear that you should use the old um, Q function. Because... Right, right. You can't just use the old Q function. There's something tricky here because you want to be optimistic, and as the discount factor increases, so yeah, does the maximum I'm possible not discount. Factor. Completely reuse that. You just keep. I mean, I was wondering whether you also should should not just just throw it away, right? Make it zero. Maybe um... probably something clever to do here. <laughs> This, this, isn't, this isn't the end of the story. Thanks. All right, so let me talk about some open issues uh, in that spirit. Um, so first, improving the bound. Uh, you know, maybe, uh, let me speculate that we can get the 15 down to two here, uh, but I don't know how to do that yet. Um, also, uh, the bound is broadly loose. And, uh, you know, this T to the four fifths in particular, is probably uh, quite loose and uh, you can probably get a lower power. Okay. Yeah, so right now we can get a much lower power if we also tell the agent what the target policy mixing or, or the word averaging time is. Right? So then we can design the agent with a lower power, but, but, uh, but we haven't been able to lower this power with an agent that doesn't know in advance what the reward option time is going to be. Okay, but that's still an open issue. Okay, and, and one thing I find particularly uh, interesting here is you know there's lots of practical tricks that uh, reinforcement learning researchers come up with as they tinker with agents. And, and it'd be very interesting to study those tricks in the context of this agent and this bound and see whether any of those tricks can uh, can lead to mathematically precise uh, improvements in this bound that, uh, that offers some insight for, for, for uh, that, that, that uh, help to justify the value of these tricks. 
Okay. Aside from that, there's many uh, inter other interesting research directions. Um, one that I'm particularly excited about these days is uh, thinking in uh, information theoretic terms. Um, and we recently uh, uh, archived this paper called Reinforcement Learning Bit by Bit, which uh, thinks about concepts of the sort we talked about today, but also much more general concepts through the lens of information theory, right? And I, uh, I think there's a lot of uh, potential there to do deep uh, and insightful and practically relevant work. Um, uh, there's also this issue uh, where, you know, um, the agent I talked about is adjusting its epistemic state based only on um, observed rewards. And you know, obviously that's pretty stupid. I mean, you, you probably, uh, when you're in a complex environment, your observations offer much richer information. And so you really wanna be learning from all that information and not only from the rewards. And, and uh, you know, there's multiple papers on, uh, uh, that think about how one can start going about this. And for example, there's this notion of general value function. That's, that's an interesting direction. Um, then this is a, a topic uh, close to Satinder's heart these days, but uh, the, the question is, uh, you know, if the environment really complex, do you really want to be designing an agent that is sort of designed to learn VQ function? Is it better to sort of have an agent that, uh, that adapts over time to its situation in the environment in a way that sort of tracks where it is uh, and where the epistemic state is sort of reflective of information that's most relevant for its current uh, 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 mode of operation. Uh, finally, um, uh, one aspect of this agent that might be fundamentally important but might be synthetic is its use of discounted Q-learning. There are also uh, uh, average reward versions of Q-learning. And, and there's one particularly uh, elegant one recently proposed by uh, Wen, Mike, and Sutton. Um, and it's conceivable that something can be done uh, along those lines uh, without uh, having to worry about this thing. Okay, so there's too much to do here. And uh, I think that uh, the, uh, clearly uh, the kinds of things that uh, you guys know would, uh, would be very helpful. Maybe I'll stop there. Thanks, Ben. So before I open it up to questions, I might just share the few things, the comments that I had. So, um, so if you could stop sharing, I'll share my content. Thanks. Sure. So thank you very much for an excellent and stimulating talk. So uh, let me just give you a high level overview from where I see it. So I was thinking of this in the context of the environment is I, if I add enough state to it, it sort of becomes, I could think of this as a partially observed Markov decision problem. Um, like I said, with a potentially enormous underlying environment state, uh, where the actions and observations are still finite valued. Um, and in that viewpoint, the history of actions and observations is sufficient for the pur purpose of designing uh, optimal controls. I mean, this of course works when the model of the you know, environment, how the environment gets updated and the observations are all known. Uh, the, the negative of this approach is dimensionality grow and complexity of the control policy grows with time um, because the history keeps increasing. And uh, the model knowledge is crucial as well. So in some sense, the context of this, the, the work you presented is in the RL context when I don't know the model, how to overcome these negatives and obtain low regret policies. And in some sense, as you said, does not depend on the environment size so much, but more on what the agent chooses to do. So in, in some sense, the solution would be sort of is pick a finite size compression of the history that can function as a state. And you couple that with uh, a particular Q-learning, optimistic Q-learning algorithm. There's a particular episodic uh, scheme that you uh, presented as well. And uh, what the main results was just showing, I mean, just the framework 
is the uh, interesting framework. But then within that, the regret of the regret is a function of the accuracy of the compression, but sublinear subject to if you remove that accuracy part. <clears throat> and uh, the analysis of the long term cost problem is sort of approached by a discounted cost problem, which I think as an analysis, it was quite interesting that we did. So just moving on to sort of thoughts and question. Um, <clears throat> so in some sense, the results are given for a given compression and, and, the, and the accuracy, I mean, the, what you get, the regret is based on its accuracy, uh, uh, there's a typo there. Uh, so the question then naturally is how to choose a good compression, say given a complexity guideline, is there some way to, that you think about it? I mean, I was, there is some recent work that I'm alluding to is could be a way of thinking about it as well as, I mean, again, the history, the whole history is an information state when I know the model, but I can also go to a belief state when I, the model is known. Um, but the core idea that these two works have been thinking about is how do you think about an approximate information state and then design fault if that approximation is good then I, uh, they want to claim that the policy will, the value function will be closer than the policy. Um, and the core idea there is it should work like a state, it should pro predict the rewards well and predict the observations well. The, when I say predict the observations, it's how the observations are generated, the random process of that. Um, <clears throat> so that was one question. And uh, sort of, uh, and the second one is like, how do you, <clears throat> In the agent model that you present, I mean, I asked a few other questions, but another one that I thought about is if I have more knowledge about the environment, I mean, here the epistemic part was mostly using the Q functions and, uh, uh, and the counts. How would I incorporate additional information uh, or knowledge into, this, into the uh, algorithm or into the, into the Aleatovic state, something that will help me learn faster? So in, in some sense, the comparison, um, there's some recent work out of Rahul Jain and Ashutosh Nair and, uh, and the student, where they, they consider the same sort of partially observed uh, Markov decision process, but they know the size of the environment in some sense. They actually know that the, uh, they also have um, not just the size, what the environment is. I mean, in the sense, what are the uh, what are the states? They don't observe the state, but they know what the states are, and they have the observation model. That is how the observations are being produced. Uh, the noisy observations are being produced from the state, and then they can get a posterior sampling-based algorithm with about two, t to the two-thirds regret, and they believe that the regret can be driven down to square root t. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, in some sense, you could argue that the the gain from your, I mean, it's not clear that there's a lower bound in any of these, but maybe assuming that this is a square root P is the lower bound and maybe your algorithm is getting P to the two, four, four by five, and maybe you're getting some additional saving because of your knowledge. And that's not clear, but maybe you can make that assumption. But in general, the question is how would you, sort of, how to use additional knowledge and how would you quantify any improvements of additional knowledge? I'm going to stop sharing and then I'll uh, get back to it. Um, so, yeah, so those are the two sort of discussing po discussion points that I had. Um, so to me, the, the framing is how I should, uh, I should talk about how this work with uh, Shi Dong uh, relates to those topics and, and those things. Yeah, it relates to that, or I mean, because in some sense you had already made a choice, the designer had chosen something and-, and um... Right. So first of all, you know, I think that, I think that um, Aditya's paper that you mentioned, uh, Fishes in Similar Waters, uh, except, and I think the paper is mainly uh, about, you know, how good of a policy you can produce given a particular fidelity of aleatoric state. Yeah. But, um, and it also starts, talks a bit about how to learn aleatoric state. But I think that one difference that is worth thinking through 
is that the dominant view in that paper thinks of aleatoric state quality in terms of its ability to predict the next observation. Mm -hmm. And that mindset hasn't worked out so well in practical agent design. And the reason I think is that if you don't do your modeling in a perfect Bayesian way, like really perfect without any misspecification, then you can think you're predicting the next observation well, but when you unroll that prediction to think about what's gonna happen in the more distant future, you actually have exponentially large errors growing exponentially with the planning horizon. Um, I think that can easily happen when you have that mindset of predicting the next observation well, right? And, uh, and I think temporal difference methods and thinking more in terms of predicting the next prediction well, uh, that tries to get away from that and seems to be more robust to these sorts of things uh, than trying to predict the next observation well. Right? And then there's generalizations of that. So actually, your colleague Satinder has worked on again, uh, having, to do with having to do with value equivalence, where maybe you want to predict more than just you know, the, the, the Q star well. I mean, maybe there's, you want to broaden the range of things you're predicting well. But it's still, I think that still allows you to get away from the brittleness of just trying to predict the next observation well. Now, at some level, this is a, an issue with other imperfections that happen in modeling. Because in principle, if you think in a perfect Bayesian way, thinking about how to predict the next observation should be sufficient, right? And that's the, um, that's the spirit of a digitist paper. Right, so I think I think everything is internally consistent and makes sense, but but in, in a sense we're, we're trying to get away from that notion of predicting the next observation. Well, right, does that make sense? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Can I ask a Can I ask a quick clarifying question on that as well? I would have thought that predicting the next observation, the co sample complexity of that, if you're trying to learn such a thing would inevitably somehow bring the complexity of the environment into play, which Ben, the whole point of your work was to somehow avoid that. I guess I'm the question is how well, right? So you can say, given my aleatoric state update function, I want to predict the next observation as well as possible right, using that. And then we need to use those predictions to roll forward and plan. Good. Right? Yeah. And my concern is, that rolling, as you well know, right? You've worked it, this rolling forward typically doesn't work out so well. Right. So, another way of saying what I was saying was that in order to get that prediction accuracy really tight, which is what you were saying, is would be needed, nearly sort of exact, you would, the complexity of the environment would have to play a role. In other words, in other words, the best prediction you could make of the observation from the aleatoric state. In your setting could be quite bad, but you're not affected by that. Right. right. That's true too. I guess my uh, second question was more on how do you sort of incorporate model, I mean, knowledge of the environment or more, if you have some idea of how the environment is evolving, how do you incorporate more or how the observations have been produced or any additional. Right. Yeah. So, 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 so this paper uh takes a frequentist worst case type of uh mindset right and uh i'm still twisting uh shidang's arm to become a bayesian uh i think that's gonna be one of the requirements to graduate but uh but 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 the paper definitely has this worst case frequentist uh, approach to things that doesn't really accommodate that kind of modeling so well but that but you know the so the, 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 the information theory paper I mentioned is much more amenable to that. So what is modeling about? Modeling is about 
introducing priors into uh, the way you do this, right? Mm -hmm. And those priors should help a lot. And in specific applications can you know, make or break uh, the effectiveness of, of, of a learning algorithm. And so you want a framework that allows you to uh, integrate that. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I think the, uh, the, the information theory paper I mentioned in many ways shares a lot with this paper, but at the same time uh, is built to uh, uh, accommodate Bayesian thinking. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, any other questions from anyone? It's, it's open, please um, um, unmute yourself and ask. So I can ask one. So it's, I guess, more, not like a qualitative question, but more technical. So uh, how do you think you know the fidelity assumption needs to be changed when we move from uh, your discrete agent states to uh, what assumption? Uh, the fidelity. Fidelity. Yeah, uh, from discrete agent states to you know like continuous mapping. So I'm thinking of like the linear function approximation settings where it seems that you cannot get away uh, without having like low inherent Bellman, Bellman error kind of. Uh, you know, approximation assumptions as well, which are in a way tied to the environment, whereas, uh, so like the one-step dynamics of the environment rather than just having a you know, value approximation assumption. Yeah, so I think this is another area where information theoretic thinking could help a lot. Um, so, uh, you know, do Katari and others have this paper that sort of says, you know, when you use uh, a linear function approximator, right, the accuracy requirements are seem, you know, um, really stringent. Like epsilon has to be tiny, you know, something like that, roughly. Um, and uh, so I was puzzled by that. I was like, wow, just because you're using a linear approximator, you need super, that kind of super accuracy. But, uh, but then I, yeah, so then I thought about it and I wrote a follow up uh, note with Shidong. Sh you might have seen that. But the, but the point is that it's, there's a sleight of hand going on there because um, it turns out that that framing, in that framing, saying that you have a linear approximator is actually supplying extremely little prior information. Right? It sounds like you're imposing a lot of prior information on, on the problem, but you're not. Right? So, so that's the issue. So it actually, you know, it's more that it sounds like it's a stringent thing, but it's not. So, so another way to think about prior information is like, how many bits are you supplying? To the agent about the environment, right? And one way, one interpretation of their result is that kind of accuracy requirement with linear parameterization is actually supplying very few bits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. So yeah, so again, in that in that area, again, I think it's information theory like thinking can can lead to more intuitive ways of thinking about priors. Mm -hmm. But I guess it's information theoretic notions in, in, in some sort of a rate distortion way, right? I mean, you compare the loss and value with respect to the information gain. I mean, there's some, it's it's more in that sense than necessarily estimating something well. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm thinking, yeah, exactly, I'm thinking rate distortion. Yeah. So what information do you need that is relevant to your environment in order to do well? Any more questions from anyone? Um, if not, let's thank Ben for an excellent talk. Thank you very much.
Thanks a lot, Ben. Yeah. All right. Thanks, PJ. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Ben. Bye.